once upon a time, there was a very happy chicken on a farm. The other animals on the farm warned the chicken that the farmer only seemed nice, that one day he was going to come and kill the chicken. But the chicken didn't believe him. Every day of its life, the farmer had come and given it some food and muttered some encouraging words. Why, the chicken asked, should things suddenly be so different? Well, as Bertrand Russell informs us in his dry wit, he invented this story, one day the farmer did come to wring the chicken's neck, showing us that, quote, more sophisticated views as to the, uniform, as to the uniformity of causation would have been to the chicken's benefit. What did Bertrand Russell mean by that? What he meant by that is that there are often scope conditions in how the world works. For a long time, certain background conditions are in place, and that makes things work a certain kind of way. As long as the chicken was too thin for the market, the farmer had a reason to keep feeding it. But eventually that changes. Eventually the background conditions are no longer the same, and suddenly something very different can happen. Once the chicken was fat enough for the market, the farmer had reason to slaughter it. Well, this week, in this course, we want to think about the causes of the rise of populism. Why is it that for decades, centuries in some places, these kinds of populists did not gain power? They may have popped up at a local level, they may have uh, gotten 5 or 10% of a vote, but they did not win office in the United States, in Germany, in France, in many countries for 50, 60 years. And now suddenly we look around the world and these populists are in power in so many countries. Well, I would like to suggest to you that in order to answer that question, we have to ask the chicken question. We have to ask how the background conditions of liberal democracy have changed in the last decades. Now, the other thing we should bear in mind is that there is always a lot of useless academic debates. And in the case of the causes of populism, those useless debates are trying to horse race against each other different explanations of why we might have populism now. They are saying it's either all about the economy or it's all about cultural developments or perhaps it's about the internet. Well, I think that it is about all three of those things and about the specific way in which those interact. All right, so let's go to the first tradition, the economic causes of populism. There's a very simple fact which is quite striking and which was true even before the coronavirus epidemic changed our economy and threw us into the deepest recession since at least the 1930s. From 1935 to 1960, the living standard of an average American doubled. From 1960 to 1985, it doubled again. Since 1985, it's been roughly flat. It's been stagnant. Similar things are true in many other countries around the world. I always think of my grandmother, whom I went to visit every summer in her small apartment in a social housing development in the city of Lund in Sweden. My grandmother had grown up in Poland, in shtetls in central Ukraine, what is today central Ukraine, and then lived in Poland, in socialist regime, and come to Sweden towards the end of her life. So all she had was a minimal state pension. And from that minimal state pension, she had uh, this small apartment, which seemed modest to me as a child, and I did not grow up in wealth. But every summer when I was there, at some point my grandmother would look at me and she would say, Never in my life could I have imagined ending my life surrounded by such luxury. For somebody who had lived through the 19th century, that was indeed the case. The things that a resident of Sweden at the very lowest end of the socioeconomic spectrum could take for granted at the end of the century were hard to imagine, impossible to imagine perhaps, at its beginning. But in the last decades, those kinds of improvements have not been as evident. Most people in my generation don't feel that we're doing so much better 
than our parents were, and we wonder whether our children could possibly do as well as us. And that changes how people think about politics in a pretty fundamental way. We never loved politicians in Washington DC or Bonn as it was then or London or Delhi, but they used to give politicians the benefit of a doubt. They used to say, well, I'm so much, I'm doing so much better than my parents were, my kids are going to do so much better than me, something seems to be working here. Now I think many of them are saying, I'm not doing much better than my parents were, my kids are not going to do as well as me, so let's try something new. This doesn't seem to be working. What do we have to lose? Now, there's been a lot of work in the last few years in political science to try and show uh, that actually it's not always the poorest people who vote for populists like Donald Trump. That in many cases, the people who voted for him are relatively more affluent than some of their neighbors. And that's an important piece of information that we have to take into account. But people don't just care about their own standard of living. They don't just care about their own checkbook. They care about the fate of their children and their communities. And it is also true that a lot of the people who vote for populists in practically every country in the world, with the possible exception of Brazil, tend to be clustered in parts of a country that are less well-educated, that have seen less investment in economic progress in the last decades, even in counties, according to one study, in which a greater share of jobs is likely to be lost due to automation because they are less sophisticated, less technology-driven jobs. So it's a fear of the economic future and it's a sense of economic malaise in the communities which I do think prepares the ground for people to vote for these populists. Undoubtedly, there's also a second very important cause of the rise of populism and it is uh, cultural. It does have to do with demographic change. In Germany, in the country where I was born and raised, there was a very clear mono-ethnic, monocultural conception of a country as recently as, say, 1960. If you'd gone into the streets of a German town and asked an average resident uh, who a real German was, they likely would have said something along the lines of somebody who's ethnically part of the German people, somebody whose parents and grandparents and great-grandparents had lived in this part of the world, probably somebody who is Christian by heritage, even if they uh, happen not to be particularly religious or devout themselves. The same answer would have been true in most Western democracies at the time in Italy and Sweden and Greece and other countries around the world. Now, over the last 50 or so years, that has started to change. There's been a lot of immigration into those societies and uh, polls show that people really have started to change their idea of who belongs to the nation. They have become open to the idea that outsiders might come into the country and uh, become as German, as Swedish as anybody else. But there are two big footnotes to that change. The first is that there is a significant minority of people who disagree with that idea, who hold fast to that more ethnic, hereditary idea of who truly belongs in the nation, and they tend to oppose these kinds of changes. The second is that some people hold on to a kind of implicit hierarchy, or at least resent the way it's been upturned. Now, I don't have much sympathy for that, but as a social scientist, I feel that I need to understand it. And the way I try to understand that is to think of a guy in a small town or village in Germany or Italy, who perhaps isn't the best looking in his town, he's not the most talented in his town, uh, he's not the richest in his town. 30 or 40 years ago, he might have been able to say, you know what, I know I'm no great shakes, but I'm a guy, I'm straight, I'm quote-unquote a real German, and that gives me a certain kind of status in this society. It makes me superior to a lot of other people around here. Well, today, that person may have a boss at work who's a woman. He may be represented in Parliament by somebody who is gay or by somebody who is an immigrant. And again, I celebrate that as big progress, but in his mind this means that his social status has declined in a significant way. And in fact, there's some very interesting research by Peter Hall and Noam Gidrin and others pointing to the centrality of social status in who votes for populists. People who say 
30 years ago, if you picture society as a ladder with 10 steps, I was on the seventh step. Today, I only think I'm on the fourth or fifth step. They are especially likely to vote for populists. Now, by the way, when you look at societies in North America, they've always been much more multi-ethnic, much more diverse than countries like Germany were 50 years ago. But they too had a very steep social, religious, racial hierarchy. And again, I think it's testament to the progress we've made that it is undoubtedly better to be a member of just about any minority living in those countries today than it would have been 20 or 40 or 60 years ago. But again, one of the ways in which that's playing out is a rebellion of those who feel like their social status is in doubt, is declining, already has declined. Finally, I think a third important reason is quite straightforward. It has to do with the rise of the internet and of social media. 25, 30 years ago, if you wanted to reach a big audience, you had to be given a platform by one of the big national newspapers, by one of the big national news corporations or simply television networks. This had all kinds of disadvantages. It meant that some important Voices were shut out of the political discussion because people didn't take them seriously, because they came from marginalized voices, or simply because they were more extreme in their ideology than whatever was thought to be reasonable and sensible at the time. But it also had some real advantages. It made it much easier to keep conspiracy theories, straightforward lies, and yes, certain forms of inflammatory and racist content off the airwaves. Well, all of that has radically transformed. We've gone from a world of one-to-many communication to a world of many-to-many -many communication, to a world in which you don't have to sit in New York City and uh, type on a typewriter a column that will be printed by the New York Times or uh, stare into a very expensive camera with dozens of people around you uh, in the studio and thousands of people around the country making sure that this is being transmitted to people elsewhere. You can fire up the laptop or the iPad or the phone you're looking at right now and send a tweet, send a Facebook status message, record a video that could theoretically be seen by millions of people around the world. Again, this has positive impacts because it allows some important voices to rise. It also has negative impacts because it allows people to spread hatred, spread lies, spread this horrible word, fake news, around the world. Structurally, the way I think about this is simply as reducing the distance because gate between gatekeepers in society and everybody else. In non-democratic societies, that's probably a good thing. That probably makes it easier in the long run for the opposition to take on some of those dictators. I still retain some hope that that remains the case. But in many democratic societies, it makes it much easier for people who are opposed to democracy, opposed to the values of individual freedom and collective self-determination to storm the political scene. And at a time when we already have deep economic frustrations in the population, when a subsection of a population is resentful about the loss of sta social status that they've experienced, when a part of the population opposes the demographic transformations that are happening in most democracies right now, the addition of that easier ability to organize and to take on the gatekeepers becomes a very dangerous cocktail. Now let me say one more thing. We could add four and five and six reasons for the rise of populism. I think, for example, that some of the people like Sherry Berman who argue for the importance of technocracy as part of the reason for frustration of ordinary folk have a very good point. In some countries you look at, the economic argument doesn't seem to hold as well. In Sweden, for example, ordinary people have continued to make real economic gains. In other countries, the demographic argument or the cultural argument may not work as well. Japan retains a quite traditional society and for immigration is rising, it is more limited than in other places. One way of thinking about this is as a form of family resemblance. Ludwig Wittgenstein pointed out that when you look at 
a family of eight or nine people. None of them will necessarily share the same feature. You cannot say they are all related because they all have blue eyes or they all have uh, you know, a particular brown hair color. But there are enough features that are shared by a large number of the members of the family that taken together, you see the family resemblance. Well, I think one way of thinking about the rise of populism is as a form of family resemblances. There are three big causes I talked about in this lecture. There's two or three others that you might add to that. If you have a sufficient combination of those, you're going to have serious populists in your country. And the nature of those populists is probably in part determined by the particular combination of factors that you are dealing with in a particular local context. Well, we're very fortunate to be joined by Shari Berman. Uh, Shari is a good friend and a professor of political science at, at Barnard College, Columbia University. Um, she's also the author, the author most recently uh, of uh, an excellent book called Democracy and Dictatorship in Europe from the Ancien Regime to the Present Day. Um, Shari, we're, we're thinking at the moment in this course about the causes of the rise of populism. And a lot of that debate is taken up with this sort of fight between it's all about economic causes or it's all about sort of cultural developments. Um, you've argued for a slightly different perspective about this, trying to put at the center uh, forms of what you call technocracy. Um, what do you mean by that? So by technocracy, when folks talk about um, you know, that kind of thing in the United States or Europe, what they're basically trying to get at is um, the sense that governments and politicians and parties have somehow or another um, gotten less responsive to the demands and the needs of the people, right? So you've talked about, you said in your class, sort of different types of explanations for populism, you know, ones that are linked in either economic trends or social and cultural trends. And I think it's very important, obviously these are, these are important trends and they obviously have to be part of any explanation for populism, but you have to sort of also step back a little bit and ask why it is that governments and politicians and parties have not been very successful in responding to those kinds of trends and problems. I mean, it is the job after all of democratic governments and politicians and parties to respond to the problems, to the demands and the needs of their citizens. So while it's important to, to examine, to analyze what the new challenges and problems are in order to understand why citizens are dissatisfied and why they might therefore decide to vote for populist parties that are opposed to the status quo and anti-establishment, you have to ask why it is that the existing establishment, the existing political institutions have not been very successful in dealing with those trends. And so technocracy or a sort of focus on technocracy is really an attempt to kind of understand some of the reasons why, again, our political institutions, the establishment has become um, perhaps less responsive um, over time. If we are trying to understand the rise of populism, then in some important ways, our democracies must have been less technocratic in the past than they are right now. What, what are some of those developments? What are some of those changes? Right. So I think that's an important point, you know, to, to make clear to folks who are trying to understand populism, right? If you're trying to sort of explain an outcome, populism, you do need to make sure that your sort of explanations kind of match that outcome, at least in some broad way, right? So if we're talking about trends that, you know, strongly predate the rise of populism, then you have to be very careful about trying to link them to that outcome. And so I think what folks who have been examining things like parties and politicians and governments over the last couple of decades has looked at is a bunch of different factors. I mean, in the US, um, I think probably a lot of people are familiar with some of the specific kinds of things that people have focused on to explain, again, why you know, the establishment has perhaps become more different or more distant from citizens. So this is some obvious things like the role of money and lobbying in politics. It has to do with, um, you know, sort of the way in which, um, you know, districts, some people think gerrymandering matters. Some people think that the change in the nature of who's running for office matters. Other people look at, um, in addition to the broad role of money and lobbying in politics, the weakening of political parties in some level, or rather the rise of outside actors, particularly on the right, um, who have come in to influence not only who runs for office, but what kinds of ideas they hear, what kinds of policies they are um, 
you know, what kinds of policies are promoted to them, and a variety, again, of different things in the U.S. that I think a lot of us are kind of familiar with from debates, but sort of cumulatively add up to the sense that, again, you know, politicians, parties, and governments have become less responsive. In Europe, the arguments are a little bit different. There, a lot of scholars have focused on I would say two things in particular. One is also political parties, although the story in Europe is quite different from in the US. Um, during the post-war period, political parties in Europe were much stronger than they were in the US. They had very high levels of membership. They had very high levels of um, uh, affiliation, very strong ties to grassroots um, activists, very strong ties to civil society organizations on the left. Obviously, that would be unions primarily on parts of the right, it would be church groups and things like that. And all of these things kind of work to keep parties very much um, in touch with citizens and to provide citizens with avenues for getting their voices heard and participating in politics. All of those things have really dramatically declined over the last couple of decades in Europe. And then of course in Europe, the other main thing that folks have focused on is the increasing power of the European Union, particularly after European Monetary Union. And here, what you've seen is a growing number of um, powers or instruments that governments would have had in the past that they no longer have. So that their ability to actually respond to challenges and respond to problems is much, much less than it would have been, again, you know, a few decades ago. And this is obviously highlighted during times of crisis, right? When people are more focused on these challenges and they're expecting more from their governments. And so the fact that, again, you know, during the financial crisis, governments no longer had control over their budgets and their currencies. Um, during the refugee crisis, the fact that Europe was trying to mandate certain kinds of policies regarding who should or should not be let in. Um, these are the kinds of things, again, that folks in Europe have kind of looked at to explain why it is that citizens may feel more disconnected from their governments, more dissatisfied with the establishment, and so on. So the methodological point that you made at the beginning there, I think, is really crucial. Um, and it's particularly, I think, a strong argument against some of the attempts to place sort of racism and racial attitudes and so on at the center of the explanation for the rise of uh, populism, especially in the context of the United States. We have a lot of survey work showing that people uh, are, are less prejudiced, are less racist, are less averse to contact with racial minorities today than they were 20 or 40 years ago. And so it's a little puzzling to say that they're voting on that now when they didn't uh, back in the past. Now, I think the strongest argument for something like the racial explanation, however, is that you can see it in the rhetoric of people. You can see it in the rhetoric of Donald Trump. You can see it in the rhetoric of all of these European populists, from Matteo Salvini to Marine Le Pen uh, to Viktor Orban. Um, do you also see this anti-technocratic element in the rhetoric of those politicians? Or do you think that operates sort of in the background at a remove where people aren't quite conscious that's why they're voting for populists? but it explains why populists haven't been able to solve the problems and therefore they then vote for populists? So I think those are, those are great points to puzzle through. And I think that's a, a sort of nice connection to make, right? Which is that, you know, people are obviously dissatisfied. They're concerned about the future. They're worried about all of these sort of trends that have come together at the same time. And, you know, one thing that politicians and parties can do, um, you know, sort of using standard political science and in, I would say intuitive terminology is agenda set, right? So people are sort of looking at the world around them and they see all of these problems. They feel like, you know, perhaps their futures are less certain than they'd like. Their current situations are insecure and perilous. And they're looking for explanations for that. And one of the things that populists have been very good at doing is providing pretty clear, pretty simple um, explanations for people's problems. Sometimes, um, as you said, that is, you know, immigrants or minorities or other potentially undeserving groups in people's minds. The other is by saying, look, you know, the establishment, the people who are supposed to be taking care of you are not, right? This is, you know, part of the reason why you hear these kinds of weird um, discussions of democracy among populists, right? They like to present themselves in the West, in particular, in Western Europe, or Donald Trump in the United States as the real Democrats. The idea here being small d Democrats, right? Um, the idea here being that um, the system is not democratic. It's not being responsive to the demands and the needs of the people. And you know, by pinpointing that or by highlighting it or by trying to make those kinds of connections, 
what you're doing is you're kind of planting in people's minds a good or for them perhaps a convincing explanation of the problem. And I think the sort of racism and anti-immigrant sentiment is another good example of that. As you said, the survey data in both the United States and Europe is pretty clear that there's been very consistent declines in both anti-immigrant sentiment and racism in the United States and Europe, but that we see this so prominent in populist rhetoric is not contradictory to that, right? I mean, a lot of people think that what's going on is what you're doing is you're taking, you know, some perhaps latent views um, in people who are uncomfortable with social and demographic change, who are uncomfortable with, you know, increasing diversity, and you're bringing that to the forefront of people's consciousness. And so they're voting on that or they're being politically, their behavior, political behavior is being shaped by that, not because it's become a deeper or more widespread sentiment, but simply because it's at the forefront of people's consciousness in a way it wouldn't have been whatever, 10, 15 years ago when politicians were dog whistling rather than being explicit about these kinds of things. That's very interesting. Um, so at some point for a, rep a reported article of mine, I went to a rally of the Alternative for Germany, the, the far right party in that country. And I was very surprised to see a bunch of Swiss flags uh, being waved. I mean, it's strange for a very nationalist German movement um, to be celebrating the national symbol of, of, of a neighboring country, of Switzerland. Um, and I asked people about this, and the explanation is that they consider the current constitution of the Federal Republic as only semi-democratic because it doesn't have uh, a provision for a national referendum. Where Switzerland, which has much more direct democracy um, with those kinds of national referenda, to them is truly democratic. So there is this argument being made. It's not perhaps the first foot forward of this populist movement, but it's certainly part of the appeal. I think that's, that's convincing. Now, I, I want to shift gears just for the last question uh, in this great conversation, which is that in your latest book, um, you take a view um, which is certainly uh, takes populism seriously. I mean, populism is not a big part of that book, but certainly you're writing, you take the, the threat of populism very seriously. You worry about politicians like Viktor Orban in Hungary. Um, you're not dismissive of that threat at all, but you do have perhaps a more optimistic vision than some about uh, the long-term development of democracy in countries like that. So let me pose the question of Hungary. Here's a country that political scientists thought was a consolidated democracy 10 years ago. At this point in my assessment, and, and we can hear whether it's also in your assessment, it is a, an autocracy. Viktor Orban has essentially taken on power. And it would be tempting to conclude that we should be very pessimistic about the future of Hungary. Now, I take it from your work that you might look at that situation and perhaps agree with the first couple of premises I put forward, um, but actually have a more optimistic road forward for what we might expect to happen in Hungary over the next 10, 30, uh, 50 years. Yeah, so first of all, absolutely. I mean, I think anyone who examines democracy, de de democratic development in general, and Hungary in particular, no longer thinks that Hungary belongs even in the, you know, electoral democracy category, right? It is now at best a kind of, you know, electoral authoritarian regime or, or just a straight out autocracy. So the reason to be, I don't know if I would say optimistic, but perhaps somewhat um, more sanguine about what's going on in Hungary is, so the book that you mentioned takes a very long-term historical view of democracy. And when, I, when you do that and you look at developments in Western Europe, for instance, also this is true, albeit in a different way in the United States, you realize how incredibly long it took, how, how long a time it took for Western Europe to develop relatively stable, consolidated liberal democracies, right? This is really a post World War II phenomenon, right? If you date the start of the struggle for democracy in Europe for the French from the French Revolution, which I think is pretty standard, you know, it's really only after World War II that consolidated liberal democracy became kind of the norm in Western Europe. And it's not just the amount of time and struggle that it took to get there, it's the amount of things that had to change after 1945 to kind of get that um, situation to occur, right? We all know about changes at the international level, the relationship of the United States to Western Europe, the putting in place of a whole variety of security and economic institutions designed to undergird Europe, um, the process of European integration, the complete restructuring of European political economies, 
all of these things were necessary to reach that you know, sort of final place where after again, you know, a century and a half of struggle, you got consolidated liberal democracy in Europe. Now against that backdrop, when you look at Eastern Europe, you know, things look a little bit different. Countries like Hungary only gained their independence. Um, they were decolonized essentially after the First World War, right? So they did not have their independence before that. Very quickly after it first got its independence, Hungary collapsed very quickly into both very nasty left and right wing dictatorship. So its first democratic experiment did not last very long. It was quickly gob gobbled up, obviously, um, later in the interwar period by the Nazi empire and then recolonized again by the Soviet empire. It only regains its independence, of course, with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989. So why is that relevant? Well, we're looking at a country that has really no experience with democracy, even less experience with liberalism, has a very fragile national identity due partially to these experiences with colonialism. And so a lot of the things that we would expect, the social things, the cultural things, the economic things that we would expect to kind of undergird successful liberal democracy simply don't exist um, in parts of Eastern Europe. Yet, when the transition occurred in 1989, the conditions were extraordinarily um, favorable, right? You had countries that um, were desperate to join the West. You had countries that were desperate to join the European Union in particular, which at that point looked like a club of prosperous, successful democracies. You had a European Union that was able to very much um, uh, force, if not, or encourage countries like Hungary to undertake a huge variety of economic and political reforms. And so while I think it was perfectly reasonable to be incredibly hopeful and optimistic um, you know, about places like Hungary in, in the early 1990s, against the backdrop of what we know um, it took to make democracy work in other parts of the world, having a sort of straight shot um, transition to democracy that turned into successful liberal democracy in places like Hungary would have been historically without precedent. So while I see the backsliding that's happened in places like Hungary and other parts of Eastern Europe, um, it saddens me and it, it worries me. It does not entirely surprise me. And I would also say that the kinds of regimes that we are seeing now in places like Hungary and Poland and elsewhere, right, where you've seen also significant backsliding, they are, you know, I mean, if one wants to take a, a, you know, a sort of perhaps a lower standard, they are a significant improvement upon the kinds of political regimes these countries have had since their independence. And there's a much greater sense of mobilization among the population and much stronger sense of, um, you know, some desire to collectively control their own fates than there have been in the past. So I would say the kinds of developments we're seeing in places like Hungary are much more similar to the kinds of struggles that eventually gave rise to successful democracy in other parts of the world like Western Europe. And so while again, the, the collapse of democracy in a place like Hungary quite saddens me, it does not entirely surprise me. Shari Berman, thank you so much for your insights and thank you so much for leaving us, uh, if not on optimistic, then at least on what you call a sanguine note. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Yasha. We're very uh, fortunate today to have Ali uh, Hochschild joining us. Um, Ali Hochschild is uh, Emeritus Professor at University of uh, Berkeley, California, um, and she is the author, among uh, many other important works, of Strangers in Their Own Land, which was an incredibly influential book, um, uh, finalist for the National uh, Book Award, New York Times bestseller. I just heard that a play was written about it even, um, and it's, it's been very influential in my thinking uh, about this topic. Um, I think in a way, I mean, it's, 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 it's a great multifaceted book, but but, but really the core of it is uh, what you call the deep story that animates people in, 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 in rural Louisiana and, and how they see the world. Um, uh, you spent many years talking to people in that area. Um, what is that deep story? What did you find about how people perceive the world and, and, and why, frankly, they're, they're quite angry about the world? Yes, yes. Uh, let me back up a little to say that um, I, uh, my purpose in doing it was to try and climb an empathy wall and try and take off my political and moral alarm system so that I could really climb into the, the shoes of, of people who believe, who live in a different truth. 
than I do. And um, so this isn't a work of description. Over five years, it's a work of translation. I am trying to translate for those of us on one side, actually what it feels like to be on the other side. So, and to do uh, that, well, I came in with a question that they immediately threw away. I came in with a question of the red state paradox. How could it be that across the country it's the poorest states with the worst family disruption, the most uh, pollution, uh, the worst education and health, get more money from the federal government than they, in aid, than they give to it in uh, tax dollars and hate the federal government. So I asked them, gosh, this is a paradox, threw it away. Oh yeah, uh, people on your side, uh, yeah, get all worried about that, but we don't like the government. There are strings attached. It's the danger. So why is the government the, strain, the, the danger? Um, and why is Donald Trump the rescuer from the government when he represents the government? This, so my question changed. <laughs> And, um, what did the new question become? How, how, what, what, what is the sort of change in emphasis? Why do they love Donald Trump? What, and I think the deep story gets us there. But what is a deep story? A, a deep story is a way of putting emotional life first by telling a story. It's a, it, because when you, when you propose a metaphor, what I did I was after five years getting to know them, asked them where they were born, went to church with them, went fishing with them, you know, played cards, and really came to develop relationships with them. And they always knew that, hey, I'm from the other side. So that was comfortable, you know. Uh, but I was saying, look, I'm really trying to tell you your story as you see it. And they said, well, good. The first thing they would say is, well, we're the flyover state. Uh, we know what you coastal people think. You know, you think we're undereducated. You think we're ignorant. You think we're pre racist and homophobic and sexist and fat. That's what you people think about us. So, yeah, you're coming to, to set it straight, you know, and tell them how we really are. Good thing. So it began like that, but always, and this is key, it, it's actually key to the deep story, but is that they feel insulted by a, um, and culturally colonized indeed, by a larger, broader, national, coastal, big city culture. And they are fighting that cultural colonization. So culture, is not minor. It, so um, what the deep story is this, I proposed a metaphor that seemed to fit with 500 pages of transcript, you know, and then I went to them, does this describe how you see things? And they said, yeah. And I was going for that, yeah, yeah, I, I live your metaphor. Oh man, yeah. You see right through me, you know, that kind of, okay, what's the metaphor? The metaphor is, and we all have one. You take, you take information out of the story. You take moral precepts out of the story. It's just what feels true. And, and what felt true to them is they're waiting in line for the American dream to the top of the hill. You can't see behind the hill what's the, the motor of that of that American dream, you're just waiting in line. You feel like you don't resent anybody. If you're not a troubled person, you're not an angry, paranoid person. You're just, you're just waiting in line for what you deserve because you're hardworking and you haven't had a raise in two decades. And you see your whole sector and people like you who are older, and white, and blue collar, and lower middle class sinking. So you're, you're being, you're waiting. And then another moment 
of the right wing deep story. Someone's stepping in line ahead of you, pushing you back. Who's that? Well, that's blacks and that's women who through federally mandated affirmative action, uh, you know, on the one hand, these jobs have been denied to them. They're now being open to them. And um, it's at your expense. Also cutting in line are those more secure and they believe better paid, not true, uh, federal workers. Hey, they're cutting in line. And those environmentalists that are putting onerous regulation on oil and, and coal, they're cutting in line. Another moment of the right wing deep story. There is Barack Obama when I did the interviews, that was him, waving at the line cutters. Oh, is he a line cutter too? Well, how did his mother, a single mother, not rich, afford Harvard education, a Columbia education? Something's rigged, they go to that. And then finally, there is a sense that they're waiting in line and much has been taken away from them. Not only economic opportunity, but they feel like what they believe, their cultural beliefs are denigrated and ridiculed and they're seen as rednecks. Uh, and uh, in fact, the last moment of the deep story is where someone ahead of them turns around, some coastal person that says, you redneck, after all that, insult to injury. And then they think, I'm done. I don't want that government. The government has been for them and not for me. Let's go get another government. And at the end of my book, I did go to a Trump rally where people seem to discover not so much him as each other. It was movement building. Wow, look how many of us are here in the bus. You know, we're, we're powerful. So he was building a movement and was charismatically saying, I love you, you love me. Uh, I am the truth. And uh, people were very excited that he was the deep story president. And it's interesting. After, so that is the story. They are, the social class they are, uh, is they are the elite of the left behind. They are not the abject poor. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're not uh, the professional middle class or upper middle class. They are in a sector from 1970 that's been tilting down. They're thinking about their kids. This doesn't look good. There's a sense of loss. Not that I never had it and now I have it. No, no, they had it and they're losing it. And they're, they're um, empowered, they feel, by Trump. I talked to, uh, doing new interviews now, and I talked to a, a man yesterday. I said, what do you like about Donald Trump? And he said, well, there are things I don't like. Uh, but he's a very narcissistic man, this right wing. Yeah. He's, he's a car dealer in Prestonburg, Kentucky, okay? He's a car dealer. Uh, he's telling me, I, uh, there are things I don't like, but he's a narcissist. And I thought he was going to say, so that's a bad thing. And he but, said, well, that's good. That's what you need in a leader. He's got to be strong. It makes him mm -hmm. kind of a ramrod against mm -hmm. all these forces. And the second thing he said that I, I suddenly understood something that I hadn't understood before is that there is a media backlash. He, he, uh, you know, this, this guy doesn't watch CNN. He says, I take a little peek at it, but I'm a Fox News person. I don't look at MSNBC. I just look to see, and then I see how they hate Trump. Mm. And it occurred to me that one of the first things he said in the interview is, well, I'm a hillbilly. And I heard that in Louisiana. Well, we're rednecks, you know. And it's and, sort of yeah. taking the insult that's thrown at them and reclaiming it as a badge of pride, right? 
That's yes, but also when Trump gets insulted, they say to themselves, I know what that feels like. Mm. We've been insulted too. He's the anti insult president. He is protecting us against this reign of insults. So kind of a, it's as if he's protective of a class. That's mm. how they, if you're standing inside their shoes, their hearts, they think, oh, thank goodness that we've got someone who's taking, taking the blame, taking the denigration off of us. It's a little like religion in the sense. Interesting. Yes, you know, that Christ took the burden of guilt off. He, he has that appeal, I think. It's not just about dollars and cents. There's something deeply emotional and psychological. And I think he has tunneled through to a lot of Christian iconography, in fact. So, so one of the things that I find so revealing about this way of thinking about the deep story and the deep ethnographic work you've done is that it helps to uh, shed light on or perhaps show the limits of the way in which a lot of social scientists have been debating the you know, roots of populism, both in the United States and around the world. And one of the debates that have dominated the literature, both in political science and sociology and a few of the other related fields is, is this about the economy? Is this that people are left behind because um, you know, they're not as affluent as their parents or they worry about their uh, children's economic standing? Or is it about culture and particularly race? Um, uh, I take it that you think that these two things interplay in in more complex way. How how would you express the interplay between them? I do. Um, it, it's it is both. I mean, and we can hold <laughs> that complexity, uh, but it isn't just economic. Uh, it's not what you hear. It's not, you know, we hear the same thing, but the two sides watch the world differently. And if you tune into that watching on the, on the right wing side, um, you, hear, uh, you hear about, well, we're worried, will my kids do as well? But you don't hear, since they are not poor, um, it, you don't hear that as as the only, certainly not the only, um, and it's it comes together with the idea of loss. So it's a mixture, but there's more culture to it than I initially thought. So now we are in uh, having this conversation in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, so it's probably a little early to know how that's going to impact those views. But it sounds like uh, this pandemic poses a version of a question that you had asked going in, which is to say, you know, if actually uh, these are people who are to some extent in real need of government help, they're not the most affluent parts of a country, um, uh, you know, why are they so hostile to government? So now we're in a situation in which people's livelihoods are being destroyed for reasons that clearly don't have anything to do with their own fault. You can have a very successful small business. You can have been very prudent. Um, it, it would have been very hard to foresee that suddenly for a, a number of months, you're not allowed to operate your business. Um, do you think that'll change how people think about the need for government? Do you think it'll change how people think about the ability of somebody like Donald Trump who incorporates that deep story uh, to actually serve the interests and protect them? I have thought that it could go either way. On the one hand, you could see that um, in an era of COVID-19, people would say, gosh, we do need government. Gosh, we do need uh, medical professionals and doctors. Uh, uh, gosh, I'm grateful uh, for those. And maybe I was wrong to, be, to hate government and um, be suspicious of professionals. Could go that way. Or it could go the other way and the other way is what i think is that's what i'm hearing in my interviews uh the other way is to say well those democrats have been trying to pull him down one way or another uh, and uh now they're focusing on every every uh 
failure of leadership uh, there. And they're actually focusing on the virus. Shouldn't we get back to work? I, I'm hearing that a lot. Um, so I think it leads them to protect him. The more he gets criticized, the more they think, oh, he's being criticized like we've been criticized. And uh, we've got to uh, protect the flawed leader kind of thing. So, um, and there's a lot of paranoia. Uh, well, who, who started this? Uh, who started this? And who's going to gain? It's the Democratic plot. So a little of that too. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, I think, what, what's the solution to this? I think uh, a solution to the split. There's a solution to COVID. There's a solution to good governance. There's getting a good leader in, involved. But if we're just focusing on the split, which I think is part of what we should be doing, but not all certainly uh, we should be doing, I think more kinds of reach out. And there are some right wing reach out folks, often in the church. I've been in touch with some very right wing evangelical uh, church people who said, yeah, we'd like to know how you see it. And, um, I think uh, we need to start zooming with them. What would that dialogue look like? I think that's one of the very interesting debates among people who are worried about leaders like Donald Trump. Um, and, you know, there are people who uh, basically say, you know, if they are voting for somebody who I dislike so strongly, who has views which I find to be so repellent, then, then we shouldn't be talking to them. And that, of course, plays directly into the herd of dignity that you're talking about. It is writing our compatriots off as not being worthy of consideration. Now, at the same time, I understand the concern that you wouldn't want to have that engagement uh, on the basis of, uh, you know, splitting the difference on important questions of moral value. So from your experience, um, you know, how should political activists, politicians, or private citizens try to engage with our compatriots who have these very different views, who have a very different deep story, um, while striking this balancing act, where we stay true to our own values, but we also show that we have mutual respect as citizens of the same country. And in addition to what you've just uh, said, uh, I think there are genuine crossover issues that we're not looking at. Talk to a guy yesterday who's a small businessman. He said, well, I really worry about small business. I said, yes. You know, it, it looks like the monopolies, you know, are, are going to grow and they can press out small business. And uh, you've got Amazon and, you know, Whole Food and, and, and so on. So the, and uh, then um, I thought, you know, Robert Reich, f former Secretary of Labor under Clinton, has written a book called Saving Capitalism, whose argument is the small business guys. The left is for the small business. It's, it's for keeping, you know, mom and pop shops on Main Street in small towns. It, yeah. So why is this guy thinking that the left isn't for them? It is. It's against big, <laughs> the big monopolies taking over. So there is common ground on this most essential issue. Uh, that's common ground one. Uh, common ground on renewable energy. They're all for that. And recycling, hey, we used to do that a long time ago. So uh, even in government investment in, um, uh, in renewables, there's common uh, ground on that on uh, government support for retraining uh, government. There's common ground on that, even climate change. I did a New York Times op-ed with my son on this one, uh, that two new surveys, one out of Yale and uh, one out of Stanford, show that a majority of both parties, big majority of Democrats, 
bare majority of Republicans agree that the government should do something uh, to stop climate change. They believe that um, the government, majority again, both parties, think that the government should invest in renewables. Majority of both parties uh, agree that the um, Trump should uh, go back to the Paris agreements. Well, wow, that wasn't true three years ago. And it's a shift of moderate Republicans, but it is a majority of both. So I'm saying there is actually a, a quite a lot more common ground. Uh, and if you even have um, Octavia Cortez getting uh, together with um, Republican Ted Cruz, they are on actual opposites of, of the political spectrum, uh, to uh, sign a bill against corruption and the revolving door between Cong serving in Congress and going into lobbying positions, both against that. That's a, a real leadership. And uh, rather than just throwing spitballs uh, at the right, oh, you've got a MAGA hat, I think there's uh, strategic possibilities uh, be good to pursue. Ali Hochschild, thank you so much for, for talking with us here in the class. Populism is um, obviously a, a complex phenomenon with a lot of uh, different um, determinants. So I think it's very difficult to identify just a single factor that is responsible for um, the increase in, in, uh, in populism in recent uh, years. Uh, but broadly speaking, um, as you've already heard in this course, there, there are two different strands of thought. Um, one uh, that um, uh, places priority on culture and another one that uh, places priority on economics. Um, my own work has been very much in the, in the, in the second tradition, emphasizing the role of economics. Um, I think the, the strength of the economic hypo economics hypothesis comes um, first from history. When we look at um, different waves of populism or um, authoritarian right-wing uh, uh, politics, uh, we often find that in history, uh, it's been um, it, it's come at moments of uh, sharp economic dislocation. Um, so, in fact, the, the very first um, uh, um, emergence of a self-consciously populist movement in history um, was in the late 19th century in the United States with the uh, um, the People's Party in the United States. Um, and and that was very much a, a movement that was left that was led by um, a disaffected um, uh, uh, farmers groups uh, that were being um, uh, essentially ravaged uh, by the consequences of uh, the economic globalization at the time, the gold standard, and 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 the uh, the populism uh, of the time was very much uh, uh, targeted against uh, the gold standard um, and um, the economic consequences on, on farmers' uh, well-being, uh, uh, essentially of uh, high interest rates and and uh, and, and uh, declining commodity prices because of uh, um, economic globalization. Uh, in, during the interwar period, of course, we the rise of um, um, far right parties, fascism, Nazism, was very much linked with the economic dislocations um, uh, of the um, this uh, turbulent uh, period of the um, interwar periods and the economic crises and the Great Depression of the 1930s. I think also uh, in the most recent wave of um, uh, um, uh, far right. Uh, uh, political movements. Now we have a, a quite a rich range of empirical studies, um, very well done uh, scholarly studies that show that um, there is a very systematic and causal relationship between economic shocks of different types um, and, um, and support for uh, especially far right uh, politicians. Uh, whether it's uh, authoritarian populist in, the, in, in Europe or it's uh, Trump uh, in, in, in the United States, 
uh, we have uh, studies that have showed that the, the China trade shock uh, in the 1990s um, has been a causal factor uh, in, in driving uh, polarization, uh, in uh, political polarization in the United States, according to, to one study, um, if the China trade shock had been um, half as strong, um, uh, Clinton would have won, Hillary Clinton would have won uh, the, the election in, in, in the 2016 presidential elections instead of, of, of Trump, uh, so that, that the China trade shock um, led to a lot of people to vote um, to switch essentially to, um, to Republicans and to Trump, which uh, who had a very uh, strong anti-trade um, as well as anti-immigrant message. Um, China trade shock has also been found as being causally important uh, in driving support for uh, far-right populists in, in Europe. Uh, it has been linked to the strength of the Brexit movement. Um, uh, similarly, we have evidence in Europe and, and the causal effect of austerity policies uh, that have driven many voters uh, uh, towards um, far-right politicians. Um, even in a place like uh, Sweden uh, that has managed uh, the uh, economic consequences of uh, hyperglobalization and, and uh, the various shocks of the last uh, two decades, um, uh, there, there's um, one good study that finds that um, labor markets insecurities and economic insecurities that associated with being um, um, uh, uh, in the in the sort of in the in the fringes of the labor market uh, is associated with support for uh, Sweden Democrats, the far right uh, group in, in Sweden. So we have a very wide range of, of uh, papers um, that that find that economic factors has been have been causally linked. Um, but I want to make one other uh, point, which I think is often missed in this discussion of whether it's it's culture or economics. Um, and, and that is to draw your attention to the fact that um, economics or economic shocks or economic insecurities act uh, um, as a driver of support for populism, uh, not just directly, but also potentially indirectly um, through how economic shocks or economic insecurity might affect uh, the cultural determinants uh, of populism. In other words, what I want to suggest is that often what you know, it may not be uh, correct to think of culture as a, a completely independent category, an independent driver, uh, that some of the cultural or identity um, or values um, uh, uh, determinants of, of popu populism may in turn be driven themselves by uh, economic uh, shocks. And I think that happens in, 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 in one of two ways. One is that I think economics uh, affects the demand side of politics, it changes the attitudes of voters. And so we also have a number of papers uh, that have found that um, in times of increased economic uncertainty um, uh, with uh, labor market and economic prospects becoming weaker, uh, we tend to find that individuals tend to develop, for example, much more authoritarian um, uh, uh, preferences. They tend to look for more authoritarian um, uh, politicians uh, that, that sort of local identities and, and social conservative um, tendencies get to be get strengthened um, uh, in lieu of uh, more uh, openness to foreigners or, or cosmopolitan attitudes. So there is on the demand side of politics in terms of shaping the preferences of voters, um, uh, economic shocks uh, tend to uh, change the way that the ordinary voter thinks of his or her identity or the how their values local communities versus outsiders. And so it might be one of the drivers of uh, anti-immigrant sentiment and xenophobia and uh, increased emphasis on social culturalism or, or you know, even sort of racism being activated to a much greater extent. But there's also another indirect mechanism now operating on the supply side of politics. Uh, which is that, uh, and by the supply side, I mean uh, the politicians, the parties, um, and um, media that uh, that um, that send out signals and and provide narratives uh, which shape uh, the terms of the debate. So I think what one thing that has happened, especially in the United States, 
is as inequality has increased, so economic factor, as inequality has increased, the Republican Party has found it more and more difficult to appeal to voters on standard economic policy grounds, uh, because the preferences of the median voter in the United States on economic grounds has moved further and further away from Republican policy preferences, uh, such as low taxes or, uh, you know, having free trade um, or um, low regulation and, and so forth. So I think the strategy that the Republican Party then has resorted to is to appeal to voters increasingly on, on uh, identity kinds of issues on cultural issues. And in the US specific context, unfortunately, that often has a very uh, sort of racialist or you know, racist um, kind of, of um, uh, uh, um, intonations. And that, uh, that there is a, a, a kind of, of latent cleavages in terms of ethnicity or race are, uh, are rendered more salient uh, by the type of uh, narratives that the right wing or the Republican Party um, has, has provided. And sometimes this is called the Fox News effect from the fact that, uh, again, the evidence that when um, you know, uh, voters who are subjected to Fox News uh, tend to um, essentially um, uh, become more ex expressive of those um, uh, attitudes and 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 um, and so forth, conservative or racialist uh, views of of, uh, of society. So I think there's there's two different ways in which economics um, affects the rise for populism. Uh, um, other than it directly, and that is through its indirect indirect effects on um, how um, the sort of voters view them as their own identity and, and the role that they ascribe to uh, cultural matters or, 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 or values, and, and those might in turn be affected by economics uh, as well. Um, but let me let me let me uh, end where I started, which is to say that I'm not claiming that economics is everything, but I'm just claiming that I think uh, there is, a, a, at least in the United States, a line of thinking that it's all about race, it's all about culture, and I think that's um, that's not an accurate uh, reading of the evidence that that economics is in fact uh, has played a very significant role in the rise of, of Trump in the United States. Um, uh, um, and also the rise of authoritarian populism in, in Europe. Hi, my name is Martin Gurry. I'm the author of The Revolt of the Public, which I hope you've had a chance to read at least in bits and pieces. I want to talk today very briefly about the chief predicament of our moment in history. Uh, one that has only been aggravated by the pandemic crisis. I'm talking about the eruption of public anger against the established order, against politics as they are actually conducted, uh, against um, society as it actually exists. I'm talking about the alienation ordinary people feel from the institutions that organize modern life, government, media, universities like Johns Hopkins. I'm talking about a conflict that pits the public, those ordinary people, uh, against the elites who manage those institutions. A conflict that is global and might as well be called pandemic. In 2019, last year, I counted at least, at least 25 major street insurgencies. They took place on every continent, Hong Kong, Beirut, Bogota, but what was remarkable from an analyst's perspective was that the, uh, these insurgencies struck in the poorest of countries, Sudan, but also in the wealthiest, France, in dictatorships like Algeria, but also in perfectly healthy democracies like Chile's. The revolt of the public is not just about economic deprivation. It's not just a cry for democracy. So, what's going on? Let me tell you a story with information as the protagonist. Way back, way back in the 20th century, when I was a young analyst of global media uh, with CIA, my job was pretty straightforward. The volume of open information was 
a trickle. Then, very suddenly, things went haywire. A digital earthquake propelled a tsunami of information in, in volumes that were unprecedented in human experience. And those are not just words. The year 2001 produced double, double the amount of information of all previous history going back to cave paintings at the dawn of history. The year 2002, double 2001. This trajectory has more or less continued. If you chart it, it really, the line really does look like a gigantic wave, a tsunami. At first, I was stupefied by the size of the tsunami, but what really mattered were the effects. Information has effects. It changes minds. As the tsunami swept across the world, behind it, I could see ever-increasing levels of social and political turbulence. This wave of trouble began to crest uh, in December of 2010 in Tunisia, first act of the uh, sadly misnamed Arab Spring. Then in January of 2011, a young Egyptian called Wael Gonim uh, posted on Facebook an invitation to a protest in Cairo's Tahrir Square. One million Facebook users saw that invitation. 100,000 said they would attend. Three weeks after that initial protest, Hosni Mubarak, dictator for 30 years, was gone. So back to the question, what's going on? Evidently, digital platforms have allowed the public to leap onto the political stage and become a leading actor there. But, but I'm talking about a peculiar organism. The public is many, not one. Online culture fractures opinion like a fallen mirror, and the public lives on the broken pieces. In the 20th century, radical groups wanted to conquer power so that they could impose a, pol a political program derived from, from some ideology. Today, the public is indifferent to power and is openly rejects organization, leaders, positive programs, even a coherent ideology. It's too fractured. It can unite and mobilize only in the act of repudiation. The public is always against. It, it strikes at the established institutions and the ruling institutions while offering no alternatives. Pushed to a logical conclusion, this ends in nihilism, the belief that destruction is a form of progress. But honestly, the most astounding spectacle of our century has been the crisis of authority of the institutions. You have to understand, the great institutions of the 21st century, government, media, and so forth, received their shape in the 20th. That was the heyday of the top-down, I talk, you listen, model of organizing humanity. It turns out that for this model to be tolerated as legitimate, it has to enjoy a, a semi-monopoly over information in every domain. You remember what I said about my early days in, in CIA. Information was scarce. Hence, it was extremely valuable. The institutions that controlled the flow of information, uh, were vested with authority. They could tell ordinary persons, top down, what the important public issues were, and often how to think about them. The information tsunami has simply swept away the legitimacy of this model. The elites today uh, who run the system are um, totally demoralized, for good reason. They know that their every mistake, their every misjudgment, every failed perception, every failed prediction, every uh, self-interested uh, act 
Every sexual escapade will be exposed and talked about endlessly. Today, elite failure sets the information agenda. So, we have a public bent on repudiation to the edge of nihilism and elites who are stuck in a reactionary dream. Um, their desperate hope is to somehow make it back to the 20th century. The decade that ended with all those insurgencies in 2019 uh, also saw other manifestations of the conflict. One is the subject of your class, populism. Uh, the rise of politicians who exploit the, this hunger for repudiation for their own ends. I think Yasha would tell you that populists like, like uh, Donald Trump uh, or Boris Johnson are demagogues who manipulate a, a gullible public by means of, for example, fake news. And there's something to that. I incline to the opposite theory, though. Populists are a club in the hands of an angry public used to bash away at the institutions. If they are unwilling or unable to play this part, they are discarded, um, fake news or not. I think the revolt of the public is aimed at the hierarchical structure of modern government as such in disregard of the political systems involved. I think the public moves online at the speed of light and, and can't understand why the elites remain so happily ensconced in their immobile pyramids. I also think that in the digital age, um, the, the government could clearly be flatter and faster, but also that the elites have absolutely no intention of allowing this to happen. That's how things stand at present in this um, weird period of induced political coma, the great lockdown. What effect will this extraordinary event have on the conflict? That's, that's a good question that I keep asking myself. It could reinforce elite authority. After all, politicians are telling us to stay home and wash our hands. Myself, I, I believe that the appalling performance of the experts and the political class uh, will accelerate the conflict and that um, we may, in retrospect, look upon this crisis as an extinction event of the institutions. The good news is, first, nobody knows. I sure don't. Second, what happens next will be, to a great extent, up to us, up to you. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Good luck with your studies. This is Martin Gurry, signing off from Lockdown Central in Vienna, Virginia. Goodbye.